Hello, fellow followers of Christ, and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing, and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce, and this is The Authority. Hello, welcome to The Authority. I'm your host, Joseph Pierce, where we continue our, our tour through some of the great authors of Western civilization. And we're in the 20th century now, and we're going to look at one of the great war poets and also a, a, a literary convert to the Catholic faith, Siegfried Sassoon. Um, so Siegfried Sassoon was born into great wealth. He is part of the famous Sassoon family, who are sometimes known as the Rothschilds of the East, to give you some idea. Uh, so they are a Jewish family, um, Baghdad, uh, Sephardic Jewish family, uh, made their money through banking uh, uh, and also through the opium trade. <laughs> so uh, um, in, in, in the days when, when, when trading in opium was not illegal or even particularly frowned upon, um, so uh, they made an awful lot of money from it. So in some sense, I suppose that Sifu Sassoon's family income, fam fa family, uh, family wealth is rooted on uh, what we would now call uh, uh, the drug trade. Um, but... Uh, so, so he's born. He's born into in, into into this opulence. Um, his um, uh, mother, his father was Jewish from this family, but his mother was a Christian. Uh, and in fact, an actual fact that his father was disinherited from the family fortune. So, although uh, the, the Sassoon still had uh, a great deal of opulence in his background, not as much opulence as he would have done if his father had not married his mother but then if his father had not married his mother he wouldn't have been born so it would have been somewhat uh, <laughs> irrelevant anyway um so uh he'd already made something of a name for himself as a poet prior to world war one but it was very much as a war poet as one of the uh of the poets uh, that documented in verse the horrors of world war one that he's best known so we think perhaps uh of uh poets such as Rupert Brooke and Rupert Brooke uh, is sometimes the early part of World War One is known as the Rupert Brooke period because uh, of the optimism the blithe the optimistic tone and jingoistic tone if you like of, of Rupert Brooke's uh, uh, poetry is all about marching off to war and the glories of war the horrors of the trenches have not yet happened and in fact uh, Rupert Brooke was killed in the very early stages of the war, so um, before the disillusionment with the war set in. So that was the Rupert Brooke period. It, perhaps he's best known for the lines, um, If I should die, think only this of me, that there's a corner of a foreign field that is forever England. Um, another poem we should, poet we should mention uh, and, and perhaps we'll, have, we'll, we'll feature him in the authority some stage in the future is David Jones, a, a, a London-born Welsh poet, a, also a convert to the faith who wrote a long, difficult, uh, sort of uh, modernist poem in this sort of manner uh, or inspired by T.S. Eliot and influenced by T.S. Eliot called In Parenthesis about his... Um, about his experience during uh, World War I. Uh, and he also wrote a very long poem called The Anathemata, which is a defense of, of, of Catholicism. Um, again, these are very difficult poems, are somewhat maybe even impenetrable, but I enjoy them, even if I'm not sure I completely understand them. I'm not completely sure that even David Jones completely understood them. And perhaps the other, the other, the other war poet we should mention is Joyce Kilmer, uh, because you know he's on this side of the pond. He obviously served in the U.S. Army during World War One and, and, and was killed. He'd already had a reputation prior to going off to war as a poet and as a Catholic convert, um, and. Um, Great things were were, were were expected of him, uh, but obviously, as is the case of so many others during World War One, they the, the, the promise was cut short by uh, by being killed by being a victim of the war itself. But the two best known war poets 
are, and their names are often mentioned side by side, are Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon. And what what, what we see about uh, these poets is that there's a bitterness towards the war, a bitterness particularly to the way that the war is being directed by politicians and by uh, uh, by, by the generals, field marshals that are, that are overseeing the, the, the war effort. Uh, and so this this new spirit of I would say cynicism, though certainly in, certainly in Wilfred Owen's verse there's an element of cynicism, but certainly a very angry response to the the the, the horrific reality of being in the trenches, bogged down in the trenches in trench warfare with all these this hideous weapons of mass destruction which have been recently invented, uh, tanks, aeroplanes, barbed wire, um, heavy artillery far exceeding anything that the previous generations and wars had experienced. It was the first great war of the machines, we might say, where, where, where men were, were mere pawns being blown to pieces by the machines. So this this this, this comes out in the poetry of Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon. We'll look at Siegfried Sassoon's poem, poetry soon. So the two men, Owen and Sassoon, met when they were both recovering from shell shock, uh, probably would be called post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome today. Um, uh, in uh, Craig Lockhart Hospital in, in Scotland. Although Owen, I think, was suffering from from, from shock in this way, uh, this trauma, um, Siegfried Sassoon was actually sent there because uh, he was a dissident. And... Uh, he could have been shot, in fact. So, for instance, he wrote a, a letter that was published and read out in Parliament in discussions uh, attacking the, the way that the war was being um, uh, conducted uh, and uh, the, the way that the, the, the people back home had no idea of the real horrors on the ground. And he, uh, in protest, threw the George Medal that he was awarded uh, into the River Mersey uh, in, in Liverpool as a protest. Now, these public acts of disobedience during time of war could easily have led, led to his being um, uh, executed for, 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 for basically uh, de desertion or, or even treason. Uh, but rather than doing that, what, uh, what the government did uh, was to declare him to be mad same sort of approach that the Soviet Union did towards dissidents and put him in a psychological institution for those suffering from shell shock. So that's where he met Wilfred Owen. Sassoon was already, he's older than Owen, already established poet. Wilfred Owen's unknown. So we, 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 we see still Siegfried Sassoon took Owen under his wing uh, in, uh, and inspired Owen to, to, to continue with his poetry. And, and Wilfred Owen is truly a great poet and perhaps we might even look at his poetry in, a, in another episode but of course the, 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 the our um, focus uh, in this episode is Siegfried Sassoon. Wilfred Owen by the way died in the in, in the last days of the war uh, whereas uh, Sassoon on the other hand um, lived a very long life. He was born in 1886 and would not die until 1967 so when, he, when he's uh, 80 or 81 years old one thing I want to say, by the way, just in case, you know, uh, the one thing we need to know about Sassoon, he was not a coward. And, uh, you know, some people might have a jingoistic attitude to war and think that anybody who criticizes the war effort is somehow a traitor or a coward. In fact, he had a nickname, which was Mad Jack. And he earned that nickname because of his fearlessness in battle. And there's a story, I don't know how true it is, but a story that was certainly told of Sassoon, who's an officer uh, in the army, taking a, a German machine gun post single-handedly ahead of his men. Uh, and when the, the, the rest of his unit arrived, they saw uh, dead Germans uh, lying around the place and Sassoon sitting there calmly reading a book of poetry. Now, I don't know if that's true, but the point is that, um, as Oscar Wilde said, um, someone said to Oscar Wilde, is it true, Oscar, that you walk down the strand with a lily in your hand? And Wilde responded, to have done it was nothing, but to make people believe you had done it was everything. So, of course, Wilde 
builds up this legend about himself as being this esthete, this lover of beauty. So people make up stories. Um, so that it, whether or not the story about Siegfried Sassoon taking the machine gun post single-handedly and then calmly reading a volume of poetry, having done so, is true or not, the fact that people could tell that story about him, the fact that he has a nickname uh, such as Mad Jack, shows that he was no coward in the trenches. Uh, he was uh, not concerned for his own safety, but for the injustice of, of, of the way the war was being conducted and the naivete and ignorance of the people back home who had no idea about the horrors of the war being um, played out. So Sassoon is a literary convert, and uh, I, I, I treat uh, him amongst the other literary converts in my book of that title, but he's not actually received into the church until 1957, when he's uh, 70 years old, and he spends the last 10 years of his life, from 1957 to 1967, as a Catholic. Some of his finest poetry is religious verse. We'll look at some of that before, before we conclude. But it seems to me, although he, he wasn't received in the church until he was an old man, uh, the, the whole of his life seemed to be a pilgrimage towards Christ and his church. You look at the development, the evolution of his poetry, the things that interest him, the tone of his voice, the, uh, the direction of his philosophical uh, musings. You can see this is a man who's deeply mystical, who has uh, is haunted by Christ. I mean, Flannery O'Connor famously said that, talked about the, the Christ haunted South, that the South, the Southern states of the, U, of the USA are Christ haunted, haunted by Christ. We can certainly say that Siegfried Sassoon was Christ haunted, haunted by Christ. Even his early verse in, during World War I, there's all sorts of imagery to, to, to Christ, to the passion of Christ. There's a poem called Stand To Good Friday Morning. Um, there's yeah, and other other poems with with specifically Christian and indeed Catholic imagery. So this stayed with him. So his his reception of the church in 1957 was, if anything, the consummation of a lifelong love affair. So uh, this being so, I had, I had long uh, since, for, for going back for a long while, wanted to write a biography of Siegfried Sassoon. So I made my own name as a writer uh, initially by writing uh, full-length biographies of writers. So I write about writers, specifically Catholic writers and specifically Catholic convert writers. So I've written books on Chesterton and Belloc and um, Oscar Wilde and Roy Campbell, etc. So I wanted I wanted to add Siegfried Sassoon to this list, and there were various obstacles to that, not least of which was... Um, uh, a, a lack of cooperation from from his son George Sassoon, who was alive at this time in the 1990s. Um, so this 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 project never did come to fruition. But I also came to realise that his life is actually best told, if anything, in his own words, specifically uh, in the words of his own poetry. Now he did write some 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 volumes of quasi autobiographical memoirs, the memoirs of George Sherston, such as um, um, uh, mem mem memoirs of a fox hunting man, um, which were very well, well received. So you could, could certainly combine this prose, uh, autobiographical material with his poetry, but his life is best told in his poetry. So eventually what I did actually, and I'm going to use this as the basis of the remainder of this episode, I'm um, was it inspired me to write I don't even know what to call it um, because it, it sort of defies genre. Um, it's that the book published of it. The title is "Death Comes for the War Poets: A Verse Tapestry Woven for Dramatic and Narrative Effect" by Joseph Pierce, featuring the work of C. Frieda Sassoon and Wilfred Owen. If you think that's a a long-winded title. <laughs> um, that's just the that's the abbreviated version on the cover. You actually go to the title page, and you see there's a whole page full there. That's the title in its fullness, but it's also a description of what it is. So I'm going to read this as a means of showing what this project was. So the full title is "Death Comes to the War Poets: A Verse Tapestry." being a dramatic presentation of the poetry of Siegfried Sassoon and Wilfred Owen with cameo appearances by Thomas Gray, Gerard Manny Hopkins, T.S. Eliot, G.K. Chesterton, Rupert Brooke, Edith Sitwell and Joseph Pierce, 
uh, woven for dramatic and narrative effect by Joseph Pierce. So what it is, it's, a, it's in some sense, it's a drama, and it was actually performed, uh, produced off-Broadway in New York a few years ago, five or six years ago, um, to, to my great surprise, to, to positive critical acclaim. So what I do here is just only three characters, Siegfried Sassoon and Wilfred Owen, and the third character is a female character, uh, Death. So Death is the female character, hence Death comes for the war poetry. And the, 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 the story basically is about two conversions. Uh, it's the conversion, it's the story of the conversion of Siegfried Sassoon, but it's also uh, the, the story of the uh, conversion of Death. Because the point is, of course, how does death seem to the agnostic or the atheist or the nihilist, uh, to the non-believer? Obviously, something more like perhaps the weird sisters in Macbeth, right? Something threatening and 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 malicious and possibly sadistic and deadly, obviously. Whereas we see uh, in 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 this dramatic presentation of the life of Sassoon. Death herself is converted, and by the time following Sassoon's conversion, she becomes almost like a guardian angel or a, or a blessed Virgin Mary figure. Um, so this that's the metaphysical dimension uh, of the of this. So I want to read the introduction to it, which is actually called "Setting the Scene." And certainly on, on the opening night, I actually stood on the stage and read this before the actors took over. But this also serves, I think, as a, as, as a good overview of who Sassoon was and why Sassoon is so popular. The following verse tapestry, being a dramatic presentation of the poetry of Siegfried Sassoon, Wilfred Owen and others, has been woven in commemoration and celebration of five anniversaries that fall in this year of 2017. First, we commemorate the centenary in April 2017 of the entry of the United States into World War I. Second, we commemorate in July 2017 the centenary of the pu publication of Siegfried Sassoon's Soldier's Declaration. Third, we celebrate the centenary later the same year of the meeting of Sassoon with his fellow war poet Wilfred Owen at Craig Lockhart Hospital, War Hospital. Fourth, we commemorate the 60th anniversary of Sassoon's reception into the Catholic Church in September 1957. And finally, we commemorate the 50th anniversary of Sassoon's death in September 1967. Like most of the great poets, Siegfried Sassoon is not as well known today as he ought to be. This first tapestry is therefore intended as a timely tribute to a writer who deserves to be more widely known, not only for the acerbic gravitas of the war poetry for which he is best known, but also for the poetry and prose that he wrote after the war. Born in Kent in southeast England in 1886, Sassoon's experience of the trenches of World War I embittered him. Although he fought with great courage, being awarded the military cross for gallantry, in battle, he was angered by the conduct of the war and the wholesale slaughter that it unleashed. In a barrage of bitter invective expressed in satirical verse, which became very popular as the initial enthusiasm for the war began to wane, he vented his spleen against the politicians, journalists and senior military officers whom he believed responsible for inflaming and prolonging the carnage. Typical of the astringent verse is suicide in the trenches. So this will be the one example of Sassoon's war poetry, which we'll be looking at. I knew a simple soldier boy who grinned at life in empty joy, slept soundly through the lonesome dark and whistled early with the lark. In winter trenches, cowed and glum, with crumps and lice and lack of rum, he put a bullet through his brain. No one spoke of him again. You smug-faced crowd with kindling eye who cheer when soldier lads march by, sneak home and pray you'll never know 
the hell where youth and laughter go. In more prosaic fashion, his soldier's declaration, addressed ostensibly to his commanding officer, but published or quoted in several newspapers, was, quote, an act of willful defiance of military authority, end quote, condemning those in power for prolonging, quote, the suffering of the troops for ends which I be believe to be evil and unjust, end quote. Having experienced the unspeakable horrors of trench warfare, Sassoon's declaration also complained about the, quote, the callous complacence with which the majority of those at home regard the continuance of the ag agonies which they do not share and have not sufficient imagination to realise, end quote. In a further gesture of defiance, Sassoon threw his military cross into the River Mersey, and his notoriety reached new heights when his declaration was read in the House of Commons. Faced with this open and very public defiance of the war effort, Sassoon was declared mentally overwrought and therefore not responsible for his actions. In true Orwellian fashion, he was confined to a military hospital in Scotland until he recovered his senses. It was here that he met and befriended Wilfred Owen, a poet who shared his anger at the war and who expressed it with the same vitriolic fervour. Owen would be killed in action on November the 4th, 1918, only a week before the armistice, one of the final victims of the dying embers of the war a slaughtered lamb, butchered before his gifts could be developed. Sassoon, on the other hand, would live to a ripe old age. After the war, Sassoon's reputation as a writer of first-rate prose, as well as, po as well as poetry, was sealed with the publication of the three-volume semi-fictitious autobiography The Complete Memoirs of George Sherston, published in 1937. In 1945, at the end of the second of the world wars, which the century of progress had wrought, Sassoon's scepticism towards modernity and its vacuous promises was expressed with razor-sharp eloquence in Litany of the Lost. In Breaking of Belief in Human Good, in Slavedom of Mankind to the Machine, in Havoc of hideous tyranny withstood, and terror of atomic doom foreseen. Deliver us from ourselves. Chained to the wheel of progress uncontrolled, world masterers with a foolish, frightened face, loudspeakers, leaderless and sceptic sold, aeroplane angels crashed from glory and grace. Deliver us from ourselves. In blood and bone contentiousness of nations and commerce's competitive restart, armed with our marvellous monkey innovations and unregenerate still in head and heart, deliver us from ourselves. As the world stumbled from World War to Cold War, Sassoon befriended Father Ronald Knox, whose God and the Atom had expressed the same post-traumatic stress in the wake of the dropping of the atom bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as had Sassoon's Litany of the Lost. Knox died in August 1957, and a month later, Sassoon was received into the Catholic Church a few weeks after his 71st birthday and a full 40 years after Knox's own conversion. Following his conversion, Sassoon the war poet became a poet of peace, a fact expressed in the title of the first volume of poetry he published as a Catholic. The Path to Peace, published in 1960, was essentially an autobiography in verse ranging from the earliest sonnets of his youth to the religious poetry of his last years. Of the latter, the long meditative poem Lenten Illuminations, written during his first Lent as a Catholic, is surely one of the finest Christian poems of the 20th century, inviting comparisons with T.S. Eliot's Ash Wednesday, which had also been written shortly after the poet's conversion. 
It is a monologue which the poet addresses to the ghost of his pre-convert self, musing on their life and how it had led him to his knees in a church. I'll quote just one stanza from this poem. While you were in your purgatorial time, you used to say that though creation's God remained so lost, such eons away, somehow he would reveal himself to you someday. For him, the living God, your soul and flesh could only cry aloud. In watches of the night, when world event with devildom went dark, you implored illumination, but never being bowed, obedient, never conceived an aureoled instance, an assuring spark. Part of the brilliance of the poetry in its own right, shining forth as a visible witness to the good, the true and the beautiful, there is also a more prosaic and practical relevance to Sassoon's life and work. Having lived through two fratricidal world wars, fighting courageously in the first, and having become utterly disillusioned with the lifeless coldness of modern secular progress, with which the world with devildom had gone dark, he had finally found the peace beyond all understanding, which, as Eliot had discovered, was the only authentic escape from the wasteland of worldliness. There is no better way to end a discussion of the greatness of Siegfried Sassoon and to summarise the wisdom that he had gained after a life of suffering than in his own words as poured forth in praise in a prayer in old age. Bring no expectance of heaven unearned, no hunger for beatitude to be, until the lesson of my life is learned through what thou didst for me. Bring no assurance of redeemed rest, no intimation of awarded grace, only contrition cleavingly confessed to thy forgiving face. I ask one world of everlasting loss, in all I am, the other world to win. My nothingness must kneel below thy cross. There, let new life begin. I'm actually going to conclude. Uh, I said I would. I my my hope was to write an autobiography of of, of uh, Siegfried Sassoon. Well, I did. So in my own volume of poetry, uh, Divining Divinity, uh, there's a poem called Dante Dilettante, which is basically a, uh, an autobiography of Siegfried Sassoon in verse. And with this, we'll conclude. Hope springs eternal on New Year's Day, 1914, and all sing old Lang Syne, but hell sings infernal songs. Who hears pray? To our ye sees gangrene, my boys, our ye sees gangrene, and I will have ye here, my boys, where our ye sees gangrene. Thus the, red, thus the red rose burns and has for thee the subtle stench of blasphemy. And bell's chime is hell's crime, and the bell tolls for thee, a virgin child so weak and wild, a lamb to the slaughter, blinking blind, fumbling find and kiss the devil's daughter. A debutante dilettante into hell to follow Dante and dance the deadly dance. And so, so soon, so soon, so soon, you join the necromance. And not in fear, no, inferno, what story worries you, bland. See no evil, speak no evil, infer no evil, glory hurries you, blind. So they cheered as you marched to war, a jingo jangled cavalier, but sneered the sign above the door, abandon hope who enters here. And so, so soon, so soon, so soon, in nightmare you're awake, with senseless insomniacs, maniacs, lamonziacs, a sight fair for awake. But the soldier is a mystic, foiling foolish fashion, and redeemed and realistic, perceives poetic passion, 
and Siegfried freed from Wagnerian curses with sacred seed, despair disperses. Upsurge surgery, open heart perjury puts perjury to flight, and purgatorial seeking, falsehood forsaking, finds paradismal light. And so, so soon, so soon, so soon, you lurch triumphant and find the key to liberty from the search circumferent. And as you turn the key, you learn to see that it, that it unlocks the paradox of paradise, the chance to cease life's labor's test. He grants you peace, ite misa. Est. Thank you as always for joining me on the authority. Please do join me next week. And until next week, goodbye, God bless, and good reading. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, Visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc, as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, Check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.